Hey everyone, Brian Zane here with another classic pay-per-view review as nominated by my Patreon backers. And well, this week's is an all-time classic in just about every sense of the word. I'm talking about the Royal Rumble 1992 from January 19th at the Knickerbocker Arena in Albany, New York. This show is nominated by Wesley Landon Woolsey, Evil Brosif, Matt Wingfield, and Francois Dubuc. Dubuc is one of those over at patreon.com slash wrestling with regret. Of course, when you think of the 92 Rumble, you often think of that image of Ric Flair going, with a tear in my eye, this is the greatest moment of my life. Of course, this was the year that Flair won his first of two World Wrestling Federation championships by winning the uh, Rumble match there. It's one of the only two times in history the championship has been on the line in the Rumble match itself. And of course, we all associate the Royal Rumble today with like surprise entrance. Not so in 92. Kind of a foreign concept back then. As in this year, you see all 30 entrants of the Rumble being introduced by a screaming Vince McMahon. The Warlord, El Matador, Sid Justice! 17,000 people packed the Knickerbocker Arena here, 260,000 pay-per-view buys. Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby Heenan are on commentary. Of course, Heenan is the financial advisor to Ric Flair at this point. He is banking everything on Ric Flair, hopefully winning the Rumble match. Now, if you're watching this on the network, please keep a keen ear toward how they refer to the name of the company they, and how they censor the initials WWF. Because, you know, during the World Wildlife Fund lawsuit, when they had to force to change their name to WWE, they had to go back and retroactively change a lot of how the Federation was referred to in older broadcasts. So you'd hear like the silent F. They'd go WW blank and they would just censor out the F. So early on in this pay-per-view, we do get a lot of that censorship on commentary and stuff. Then by the end of the show, it seems like whoever is censoring the F stopped giving Fs because you hear the full initials being used pretty much every time. Your opening matchup sees the Orient Express with Mr. Fuji taking on the new foundation. That's Owen Hart and Jim the Anvil Neidhart. And boy, oh boy, folks, uh, that's a whole look right there. There, uh, you know, the pants, the jackets, the headbands. Uh, Bobby Heenan says they're wearing their pajamas. They just got out of bed. This is peak early '90s look, by the way. But Owen and Jim, they deserved far better than this. Owen shows off his agility against Kato, and the crowd loves it. Nightheart easily overpowers his opponents. A big double cross body by Owen early on as well. Owen goes to grab Tanaka on the outside, while the referee's back is turned. Fuji jabs Owen in the neck with his cane. Owen gets worked over for several minutes here, including a big low blow headbutt by Tanaka. Monsoon says on commentary, just like the Midnight Express, the Orient Express will be tough to derail. I don't think he was making a reference to the NWA tag team of the same name around that point. Referee misses the hot tag by Owen. While the referee is distracted by Jim, Owen is hucked into Fuji's cane in the corner and it snaps in half. Here at break. Captain skips a lot. Distracting the referee. Owen gets some hope spots with a suplex, a heel kick. He finally tags in Neidhart. He's full of coke and fighting spirit, folks. Kato is ejected from the ring. Rocket launcher onto Tanaka. The new foundation win. It's their only victory on pay-per-view. I give this one three and a half stars out of five. It is a very simple old school formula when it comes to tag team wrestling, but it's done so well by all four of these guys. They tell a great story. It's a fun opener. Not much else I can say about it, but yeah, it's just great to see uh, these guys in action, but man, those pants, they gotta go. We go backstage to see Lord Alfred Hayes giving a recap of Bret Hart defending and losing his IC championship against the Mountie two nights earlier in Massachusetts. Says he has wrestled against doctor's orders wrestling through a triple-digit fever. After the match, Mountie beats down Bret some more until Roddy Piper makes the save. Mountie decks him with the title and Piper is piping mad now. Sean Mooney interviews the Mountie with Jimmy Hart and Hart goes, Hey baby, Bret Hart is sick from losing! <laughs> the Mountie says he will take Piper Piper's manhood and dignity away from him. Elsewhere, Piper's cutting a promo on the Mountie, calls him a member of the village people. In regards to Mountie's comments saying he's going to take Piper's dignity, Piper says he has none. How do you think he made it this far? Then he wraps up his promo by saying, I think you've been dreaming and it's been all wet too. Ha <laughs> ha! Come jokes, everybody! Intercontinental Championship match up next as the Mountie defends against Roddy Piper. Kind of a cool historical footnote here because Piper's going to be in the Rumble match as well, win, lose, or draw this one. So he has the possibility of winning both the IC and the World Wrestling Federation Championships in a single night. Bobby Heenan cannot imagine the championship, he says, being defended by a man in a skirt. Piper opens up by shoving said skirt or kilt into Mountie's face, peppers him with some punches before the Mountie powders. Piper steamrolls Mountie early on, but he whiffs a drop kick, which allows allows the Mountie to Mountie inoffensive, so to speak. Heenan on commentary asserts during the match that it's not that impressive that Bret Hart wrestled with 104 degree temperature. He says, I wrestled with 113 degree temperature and, and Monsoon's like, if you did
that, you'd be dead. Piper bops Mountie out of the ring, yells at Jimmy Hart on the apron. Mountie skins the cat and goes for an attack, but he hits Jimmy on accident instead. The sleeper is applied. Piper wins. He jabs Mountie with the cattle prod for good measure, makes a weird game show buzzer sound. Hey, yes! I give it two and a half stars out of five. It's a fun little match. It goes a lot longer than I remember it being. For some reason, I seem to recall like Piper beating Mountie really, really quickly for the belt, like in under a minute, but I think I'm confusing the length of the match with the length of Mountie's title reign, which was only two days. Be that as it may, fun to see Piper win this one. It's his first and only singles gold in the company. He wouldn't win another championship until way up ahead in the year 2006, when he and Ric Flair beat the Spirit Squad at Cyber Sunday to become the World Tag Team Champion. Champions. Piper, by the way, in this reign, he would go on to drop the Intercontinental Championship back to Bret Hart at WrestleMania 8 in the Hoosier Dome. In a Coliseum video exclusive, Hulk Hogan talks to Lord Alfred Hayes about being in the Royal Rumble match, says he'll have no friends after winning the championship, and that's the tea. Back to the main pay-per-view, Mean Gene's interviewing the Bushwhackers and Jameson. Luke and Butch refer to their opponents as the Beverly Sisters, as we go to that next match now, as the Beverly Brothers with the Genius take on the Bushwhackers with Jameson. So who is Jameson, you might be asking? This is something that I had to do a little research on, because he was well before my time as a fan. I always heard his name being referred to, like, and WrestleCrap.com and other websites and stuff, so had to do a bit of digging to figure out who this person is. So, Jameson, who's a full character name, by the way, is Jameson Winger, who I just discovered today. He's an actor named John DiGiacomo, who developed this nerdy character while working in an improv group. It was inspired very heavily by Jerry Lewis's character in The Nutty Professor, and so he was actually discovered by Vince McMahon when Vince went to an improv, to that same improv show, like, for, to celebrate a friend's birthday. So he met Vince McMahon uh, at that show, and that's when Vince gave him the opportunity to play the Jameson character on his own programming. So he debuted as the sidekick on the Bobby Heenan show. So kind of like the Ed McMahon to Bobby Heenan's Johnny Carson, but Heenan, he's a sleazy guy as Heenan, but he's got class and sophistication and everything. And Jameson is this frumpy nerd who smells real bad, eats sardines and humps pillows. Yes, that actually happened on the programming there. So anyway, when that show, the Heenan show was canceled, he actually was able to stick around with the company for about three years total, kind of showing as kind of an uh, on-air personality, occasionally as a manager, like with the Bushwhackers in this case. Very fascinating story arc for Jameson here. The genius cutting a poem here, calling Jameson a waste of human tissue. He and also joining in with the tearing apart of this nerd who takes a dinner roll out of his pocket and eats it at ringside. Lots of shtick to open this matchup. Typical Bushwhacker contest. The Beverly's get a cheap shot on Luke to start the action, but they counter with a bite on the Tookus to bow. Blake Beverly with a cheap shot on Butch here. By the way, Blake is the future Mike Enos who would have a bit of a run in the late 90s in WCW under his own name. In the words of Vincent Mann, he's an enus. The Whackers clean house on more than one occasion, do a lot of goofy stuff. More butt biting, Luke is able to evade some attacks. Monsoon claims on commentary that Bobby Heenan is just jealous that he doesn't get to manage the Bushwhackers, and of course, Heenan's incredulous of that statement, says, I like to manage them to the electric chair. The Beverlies get their heat on Luke. The genius then walks up and slaps Jameson in the face. Luke with a clothesline to bow out of the corner and a hot tag to Butch. By the way, I'm doing a lot more saying the Beverly Brothers' names in this commentary than Monsoon and Heenan do at all in this match. They are I don't think they're ever referred to by first name basis in this matchup. Butch gets tripped up, top rope axe handled by Bo, Blake makes the pin and wins the match. But the Bushwhackers get the last laugh, hitting a pair of battering rams on the Beverly's and grabbing the genius. Jameson gets in the ring and after a whole lot of setup, finally kicks Lanny Potho in the shin and in the back to send him flying. Yeesh, she deserved better than that. I give this one one star out of five. This is, you know, it's a campy comedy match. It's for the kids. In fact, uh, my five-year-old, she walked in uh, as I was watching the show and she caught this particular matchup and she was pretty entertained. So I guess it did its job for her. But, you know, it's, it, it was a bunch of, like I said, a lot of shtick, lots of dancing around, lots of being goofy. They did everything well. Like no, there were no real botches in this matchup. Just it was, it was boring and it was cheesy. And it's really the worst match on this show, on a show where there aren't a whole lot of matches to spare, but you know, it, it's not for me. Backstage interview with the Legion of Doom and Big Shock, they yell a lot. Hawk says, you know, the natural disasters, they like to throw their weight around. Well, we have no problem throwing your weight around too. 
We go to that match now. Tag Team Championship on the line as LOD defend against the Natural Disasters. The Battle of the Big Boys here. Typhoon's unfazed by Hawk's shoulder tackles until he's finally taken down with a top rope tackle. Hawk also does a standing dropkick to Earthquake, who does not budge. Earthquake himself then goes for a dropkick as well, but Hawk dodges. Holy hell, look how fast Animal's hitting those ropes as we get a double clothesline. Goes to pick up Quake, but he's too heavy. Typhoon with multiple backbreakers to Hawk, and the Disasters begin to pound away on him, throwing their weight around as it were. Hawk tries to fight back, but he falls into a bear hug. Hawk evades an avalanche, makes Quake timber with an elbow, and makes the tag to Animal. They fight on the outside. Typhoon gets back in the ring before the 10 count, and the match ends. The Natural Disasters win the match by countout, but they do not win the championships. LOD then get back in the ring and beat up Quake with a steel chair after the match. Ray, the edge always lies with the champions for one simple reason. The title can only change hands on pitfall or submission. I give it two stars out of five. Now, obviously, by no means is this match a technical masterpiece, and the count-out finish is kind of disappointing. But on the other hand, it's still really impressive and fun to watch this match for how much weight gets thrown around here, how much beef is on display, pal. Just these guys with all this strength and the size going against each other. It's really fun to watch. If you like big hoss matches, like this, except for the finish, it's a pretty fun matchup. LOD would lose the belt to Money Inc. a few weeks later, then they briefly leave the company for a while before coming back with Paul Ellering and their puppet mascot Rocco, but that's a story for another time. After the match, Sean Mooney interviews the Disasters, and Earthquake and Typhoon sound pretty much the way you would expect two huge blown up guys to sound. We have the titles! I can't believe what it! What happened? How come they were taken away? Be a pinball, to take people see it. They were cut out of the ring! We are our hands held high! We see Roddy Piper again being interviewed. He's going absolutely crazy. He is manic in this promo here. He says, the other 29 guys are going to fall down like President Bush, but at least Bush got back up. He's got a dream. He has a dream today. And he dedicates this match to Colt, his son. Aw. We then go back to Sean Mooney interviewing Shawn Michaels, who just the previous week committed one of the biggest tag team breakups in wrestling history, putting the dagger in the back of Marty Jannetty's super kick, throwing through the barbershop window, and actually taking him out of the Rumble match itself. I forgot that this breakup took place just before, just around this Rumble. So it's kind of cool how close that moment in history is to the actual other moment in history here in the match itself for the Royal Rumble. Shawn Michaels says he spared Marty 29 other beatings. He's going to walk out the World Wrestling Federation champion. In another Coliseum video exclusive, Lord Alfred Hayes talks to Ric Flair, who reveals he is number three in the Rumble match, but he's not at all concerned. He says no matter what, he's still going to walk out the champion. We then get a montage of other Rumble hopefuls, Randy Savage, Sid Justice, Repo Man, the British Bulldog, Jake Roberts, Ric Flair with Mr. Perfect, The Undertaker with Paul Bearer, and Hulk Hogan. And with that, it's time for the Royal Rumble match, where the winner will become the undisputed World Wrestling Federation champion. So the background of this match is, uh, during Survivor Series, then a few days later at this Tuesday in Texas, The Undertaker and Hulk Hogan traded the championship back and forth, both matches ending in very controversial fashion, until President Jack Tunney finally stripped Hogan of the belt and declared a new champion would be decided at the Rumble match, guaranteeing that Taker and Hogan would be somewhere in the final 10 spots in the Rumble matchup. This is the first of two times, like I mentioned, the championship was on the line in this matchup. The next time we'd see that is in 2016 when Roman Reigns defended the championship in the Rumble match itself, which Triple H won. Number one and number two in the match are the British Bulldog and Ted DiBiase. After a little bit of fighting, the Bulldog eliminates DiBiase right away. And at number three, there he is, the nature boy and the alleged real world's champion, Ric Flair. And Bobby Heenan is incensed, going, no, damn it, that's not fair to Flair. All night long, Heenan's been expressing his trepidation and his nerves on commentary because he didn't know what number Flair was going to be at. He's been in isolation away from Perfect and Flair all night doing commentary with Monsoon. And so Monsoon would kind of like, rib him all night about, oh, are you paranoid about where Flair is going to end up? So, of course, since he is the financial advisor of Flair, he stands to gain a lot of money should Flair win this matchup, also stands to lose a lot of money should Flair lose the matchup here. But yeah, this is definitely Heenan's magnum opus on commentary is widely considered to be here in this matchup because he is just on all night. For all night, he is gold. But this match in particular, because he's such a homer for Ric Flair the entire time, it's just great stuff here by Heenan. Flair is thrown hither and yon by the Bulldog early on, but holds his own. 
known. Number four, Nasty Boy Jerry Sags. It's two on one against the Bulldog, but then Davy Boy eliminates Jerry. At number five, it's Haku, who's actually filling in for Nasty Boy Brian Knobs, who was stabbed shortly before this pay-per-view, so Haku's replacing him here. He goes right after Bulldog. Eventually, all three guys attack each other. Bulldog takes out Haku. Just before number six, it's Shawn Michaels, who attacks both Flair and Davy Boy. At number seven, it's El Matador, Tito Santana. Big low blow by Flair to Bulldog. He then says he'd do that to his grandmother if he had to. Number eight, The Barbarian. Number nine, Texas Tornado. Kerry Von Eric is a house of fire. At number 10, it's the re re Repo Man. At number 11, Greg the Hammer Valentine. He and Flair get right at it. Former tag team partners going after each other there. At number 12, it's Nikolai Volkov. Valentine gets Flair in the figure four in the middle of the ring as Volkov is quickly eliminated by the Repo Man. Number 13, The Big Boss Man. He lays into everyone. Greg Valentine's taken out by Repo Man, then Boss Man eliminates Repo. Man, just when Repo is starting to look good and dominant there. Great shot of Flair, Bulldog, and Santana all together in the corner, all with their hair wildly out of place. Really tells the story there. Flair eliminates the British Bulldog and the Texas Tornado. If you're a noun from a place, Flair wants nothing to do with you. At number 14, it's Hercules. He eliminates the Barbarian who is trying to take out Flair. Boss Man then eliminates Hercules. Flair and Boss Man do some one-on-one -on -one work for a bit. Boss Man's got too much momentum though and takes himself out of the match. At number 15, it's Roddy Piper, officially becoming the first man to pull double duty at a Rumble pay-per-view. Here's a pairing with some history, Piper and Flair. Piper laying into the Nature Boy as we cross the half-hour mark in the match. Piper gets the sleeper on Flair, and at number 16, it's Jacob the Snake of Roberts. He takes his time and lets Piper finish Flair off, but it's a swerve. Flair's laid out for a minute or so. Piper hits Roberts, which leads Heenan to compliment him. Then he hits Flair, which leads Heenan to turn on him again. I never thought I'd say this, but thank you, Roddy. It's a kill. It's not a skirt. Well, you no good creep. You skirt wearing freak. At number 17, it's Jim Duggan off to a hot start at the beginning, but he's laid out with a reverse atomic drop by Roberts. Number 18, IRS, the noggin knocker to Flair and Roberts there. They talk about Jake the Snake's paranoia on commentary, how Randy Savage could show up at any point in the matchup. These guys have had a long-standing, deeply personal feud for several months at this point. It was Roberts who uh, attacked Savage at he and Elizabeth's wedding, had the Cobra pop out of the box, had a Cobra biting Savage's arm. He slapped Elizabeth. This is a very, very personal feud. And so the whole story here is that Roberts is keeping one eye open for Savage at all times. At number 19, it's Jimmy Snuka who gets booed, it sounds like. Are you saying boo or sue? Superfly, Abina, okay. Jimmy Snuka. Jimmy Snuka, I mean. See? At number 20, it's The Undertaker. Ten men to go in this matchup. Taker eliminates Snooka and throttles Flair in the corner. Number 21 is the Macho Man Randy Savage, who makes a beeline for Roberts, who's in hiding. The two eventually start fighting each other. Savage with the axe handle eliminates Jake Roberts and then himself by going over the top rope. Seems to have forgotten that little rule in the Rumble match, but then they retcon things on commentary. Says, oh, he's still in because he eliminated himself. Tell that to the big boss man. At number 22, the Berserker. Huss, huss, huss. Huss, awkward landing for Savage after a double-handed throw toss by the Berserker. At number 23, hide your breadsticks, it's Virgil. At number 24, former world champion, Colonel Mustafa, aka the Iron Sheik. Number 25, the previous year's Iron Man, Rick the Model Martell makes his way into the matchup here. Duggan gets a USA chant started. Number 26 is Hulk Hogan, the winner of the 91 Rumble, and the arena blows up. Hogan takes out the Undertaker and the Berserker. Duggan eliminates Virgil, but he also falls out of the ring. Number 27, Skinner. Not much to say about him. Number 28, Sergeant Slaughter. Skinner gets dumped out. Flair officially becomes the all-time record holder for time spent in the Rumble match. That record would eventually be broken. Heenan on commentary. Give him the title right now. He's earned it. At number 29, Sid Justice. Back in the ring for the first time since suffering an injury back in the fall. And at number 30, it's the Warlord. One of these nine men will become the next world champion. On the outside, Hogan suplexes Flair on the floor. Sid Justice hurls Sergeant Slaughter to the outside. Slaughter's gone. Piper eliminates IRS by his tie. Justice and Hogan work together to eliminate the Warlord. Then Justice takes out Piper and Martell together. The final four are Hogan, Savage, Justice, and Flair. Flair hits Sid with a flying knee, which causes Savage to go out. Hogan stomps on Flair, then Justice dumps Hogan out. Hogan cannot believe the betrayal, brother. Hogan grabs Sid's arm from the outside, which allows Flair to dump out Justice. Justice, making Flair the winner and the new champion, and Heenan is over the moon. Yes! 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 Flair did it! Yes! 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 yes. He did it! I talked about it! 
I give it five stars out of five. I don't think it's hyperbole to say that this is the best Rumble match of all time, and for so many reasons too. Not only just the star power in this matchup, not just because of the stakes involved in this matchup, but also that the story of Ric Flair, obviously, going from number three to the end. Originally, it was pitched by Bobby Heenan to go number one to the end, but then Vince changed it to number three. So there's that story. Heenan sucking up on commentary the entire time. His whole story arc and his ups and downs and his denial and his acceptance of, you know, just like, oh God, the, 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 the agony of Flair being in that matchup is too much for his heart to bear. Uh, and then the other storylines got weaved in there as well with Savage and Jake Roberts, Hogan and Sid Justice beginning there. So many reasons that this is the greatest Rebel match of all time. And I don't think there's going to be a lot of people who disagree with that sentiment. After the match, Hogan chases Flair out of the ring. Justice gets in his face and it's broken up by officials. This begins the slow build to a full-fledged heel turn by Sid. These two will face off at WrestleMania 8 and that's a whole thing. This, by the way, is Hogan's last ever Rumble match. Match. We then go backstage where President Jack Tunney awards Ric Flair the championship and there's that classic with a tear in my eye promo and Gene says put that cigarette out. My final grade for the 92 Royal Rumble is a B plus. You know, like the Rumble match itself, Royal Rumble pay-per-views are generally kind of difficult to grade as accurately or fairly as other pay-per-views that don't have that kind of structure because the Rumble match being so long, it cuts the number of other non-Rumble matches, and the Rumble match itself is a big extended battle royal, so hard to really judge those compared to more traditional matches and shows. Be that as it may, I think on the whole, it's a pretty entertaining event. Only one real stinker of a match on this card being the Beverly and the Bushwhackers. Everything else uh, that's not the Rumble is good to great. No real complaints about the shows in itself. And of course, the Rumble match itself really helps elevate the rest of the show in terms of overall quality. So it's definitely a fun show to watch. If you haven't watched this show yet, then I recommend you do so. Well, I hope you enjoyed my review of the 92 Royal Rumble. If you want to play a role in determining which shows I look at, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and you'll have a chance to nominate classic shows for me to review. Next time on the classic segment, we go back to the Royal Rumble once again, but a little further into the future. This time it's the Royal Rumble 2004. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.